This morning we're going to, I think we're going to round out our foundation series. We've been talking about some of the most foundational sort of things, under things we need to understand about the Christian faith that, that help us to follow Jesus and help us to grow in our faith. And we, we talked about things like, you know, what the gospel is and how does somebody become a Christian. And, and we talked about baptism. We talked about prayer and all sorts of stuff. And, and so really to kind of to sort of round things off, I, I thought we, we would do um, one last one last. Um, uh, session we, and and on the topic of how do we grow as a Christian? How do we grow as a Christian? Um, <clears throat> I think a lot of people kind of have this question. I I I know I know for me when when I when I first became a Christian, um, there was not a, like an orientation process that you kind of underwent. It was, I remember I had a dramatic experience with the Lord in, in, a, in a youth group, and there was just like all of a sudden I was going to church every Sunday, and there was no kind of orientation process about what I was supposed to do next or, or how, how, you know, how am I supposed to kind of live now or, or anything like that. And, and in many ways, it was kind of confusing. It was kind of confusing. I didn't know and, and understand a lot of really sort of foundational things of the faith, and so I made a lot of mistakes. I believed a lot of things maybe I shouldn't have believed. I believed a lot of people who told me a lot of stuff that just probably wasn't true in the end. You know, I'm, you know, I remember, um, I remember the first night I got saved. I was so excited about Jesus. Um, I wanted to go out to the pub that night and tell all my friends about Jesus. Now, I didn't know exactly, you know, thinking back, I didn't know exactly what I was going to tell them because um, I didn't really kind of understand exactly what exactly had taken place in my life. But I was just so excited, you know. And people stopped me in my enthusiasm. They're like, "Look, no, you can't go. You can't go to. Uh, you can't go to a pub. There's demons there that will make you drink." I remember being like, oh, wow, oh, um, it didn't make sense to me, but I was also like, well, I'm a brand new Christian. I don't, I don't know these things. Maybe, maybe that is true, you know, and so I, I didn't go. But, you know, quite often when, when people come to faith, we don't, we don't kind of give them all the tools that they need in order to follow Jesus successfully. And so this morning I want to talk about, I want to talk about how do we grow as Christians? How do we grow as Christians? The gospel is about a new way of life. It's not just a one and done thing. It's not just a decision you made at one point and now you've sat down and you're going to warm a seat until eternity. Um, the Christian life is just that. It is a life. When Jesus came, when he came, he came to institute a new kingdom, to inaugurate a new kingdom, a new and living way of life. And he does it through the cross. He does it through the cross. He dies on the cross for our sins and he conquers the powers of sin and death and opens up the way for, for our forgiveness of sin, for, for, for our freedom from sin and death to give us newness of life. He's done that for us and, and we need to learn how to participate in that. We need to learn how to grow in that as we begin to follow Jesus. And so this morning we're going to talk about how do I grow as a Christian? So the first point, first point I want to touch on is this, is we need to ask ourselves this question firstly. What does it mean to grow as a Christian? I think that's, that's probably a good, a good starting place for us to begin. What does it mean for us to grow as a Christian? Because growth can mean a lot of things in a lot of different ways. But for us, we want to make sure that before we set out on this journey, that we have our coordinates right, that we're heading in the right direction, that, that what we're aiming for is a correct and good goal for us to actually aim for. You know, if you're, if you're, if you're you know, on, a, on a journey, you get in your car, you're going to go somewhere you've never gone before. What do you do? What do you do? You, you, you know, I was going to say you look up a map. People don't do that anymore. But you, you get out your phone and your GPS and you put in the coordinates, right, and you look up you put into your GPS where you're going to go, and it'll show you the way that you're going to go to this, this brand new place you've never been before. And it's going to show you the way. You know, and Jesus' disciples, they had a similar conundrum. Jesus was saying to them in, in John 14, look, I'm about to go. I'm about to head off, all right? Um, but don't, go, don't, don't worry. I'm going to prepare a place for you, you know, where I'm going. You know, <laughs> you know, uh, you, you'll know the way. And they're like, Jesus, how, how are we going to know the way? We, we, don't, we don't know where you're going. He's like, don't worry, I am the way. I am the truth and I am the life. You know, and anyone who's going to come to the Father is going to come through me. And so Jesus told his disciples that he was the way. And I believe that, I believe that 
that's probably a good starting point for us. That's a good starting point for us. If we're going to ask ourselves a question, what does it look like to grow as a Christian? What does it mean for us to grow as a Christian? I believe the starting point has to be Jesus. It has to be Jesus. In Ephesians 4, Paul will, Paul will give this reflection to the church in Ephesus. He says, he, gave, he himself, this being Jesus, um, gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors, and some teachers to equip the saints for the work of the ministry, to build up the body of Christ until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of God's Son, growing into maturity with a statue, a, a, a statue, stature, we're not getting statues, uh, stature <laughs> measured by Christ's fullness. Then we will no longer be little children, tossed by the waves and blown around by every wind of teaching, by human cunning with cleverness and the techniques of deceit. But speaking the truth in love, let us grow in every way into him who is the head, Christ. For from him the whole body, fitted and knit together by every supporting ligament, promotes the growth of the body for the building itself up in love by the proper working of each individual part. So Paul, in his reflection to the Ephesian church about unity in the church and how each and every single part of the church, every member of the church is necessary and essential to the growth of the rest of the body, he says what we're doing as the body of Christ is we are growing up into maturity into Jesus. We're growing up into maturity into the character and likeness of Jesus. He'll reflect also in 2 Corinthians 3 on, on something very similar to this. In 2 Corinthians 3, verse 17, he says, Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And we all, with unveiled faces, are looking as in a mirror at the glory of the Lord and are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory. This is from the Lord who is the Spirit. What Paul is saying there is that, is that this glory that we have beheld in the Lord... This glory that we've beheld in the Lord by the Spirit, the very radiance of God's goodness, His character, His love, this thing that we behold in Jesus, as we behold that together as, as God's people, we are being transformed into that image. And so if you're asking yourself, well, what's the point? What, 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 where am I going in the Christian life? What am I supposed to be doing? What is supposed to be happening for me as a Christian? You are being transformed into the image of God. You are being transformed into the image of the Son, the very radiance of God's glory. And I believe that's reflected, not that you become God, but that you become a reflector of the very character of God here in the earth. You become a reflector of the very character of God here in the earth. So if we're to set the goal in mind, and we're asking ourselves the question, what does it mean for us to grow as a Christian? What does growth look like? I would say that growth as a Christian looks like being transformed into the character of Jesus. Being transformed and conformed to the very character of of Jesus, the very character of God revealed in His Son, Jesus Christ. Which brings me to my next point. Imagine you're a plant. Imagine you're a plant. What kind of plant would you be? This is not a personality thing. We're not, this is not a getting to know you exercise, okay? But imagine you're a plant. Right? The Bible uses a lot of agricultural metaphor and analogy to convey truths about the kingdom of God. Right? So we're just gonna we're gonna lift that off and we're gonna lift that out of the Bible this morning and we're gonna pretend that we're plants. In fact, Jesus, Jesus made this illustration himself. He says, um, I am the true vine. This is what he says in, in John uh, 15. Um, John 15, starting in verse 1. He says, I am the true vine, and the Father is the gardener. Every branch in me that does not produce fruit, he removes, and he prunes every branch that produces fruit so that it will produce more fruit. You are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. Remain in me, and I in you, just as a branch is unable to produce fruit by itself unless it remains on the vine. Neither can you unless you remain in me. I am the vine. 
You are the branches. The one who remains in me and I in him produces much fruit because you can do nothing without me. If anyone does not remain in me, he is thrown aside like a branch and he withers. They gather them, throw them into the fire, and they are burned. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you want and it will be done for you. My Father is glorified by this, that you produce much fruit and prove to be my disciples. <clears throat> so if we imagine that we're a plant, and we're asking ourselves, well, what kind of plant would I be? Well, <clears throat> we have to ask ourselves a question. How do we know what kind of plant we are? How do you know what a, a lemon tree is? It produces lemons. How, how can you tell what an apple tree is? Because well, it produces apples, oranges. Orange trees produce oranges. Every tree produces fruit according to its kind. And so if we're plants... And Jesus says that he's the vine and we're the branches of this vine. What kind of fruit are we expected to be producing? What kind of plant are we? After all, the kind of plant we are will be determined by what fruit we are. Well, by what fruit we are producing in our lives. You know, no one has ever gathered figs from a thorn bush. I believe that's Jesus, right? No one's ever gathered figs from a thorn bush. You know, no one's ever gathered apples from a lemon tree. What kind of fruit you're bearing will determine what kind of tree, what kind of plant you actually are. And so, holding with this analogy, and we're asking ourselves a question, if we're plants, and we want to be growing to be like Jesus, what kind of fruit should we be bearing? What should this look like? Paul will say in Galatians, he says, The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. The law is not against such things. Now those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions. You, as a branch of the true vine, as a plant, of Jesus, a Jesus plant, if we're, if we're going to use the analogy, need to be producing Jesus-like character. That's, that's, that's the fruit that you're going to be producing in your life if you're truly going to be a disciple of Jesus. If you're going to grow up into the likeness of Jesus, you're going to be producing this kind of fruit in your life. Which brings me to my next point. You were made to grow. You were made to grow. Sometimes people get really intimidated when they look at Jesus and they, and they see how far they have to go. People get really intimidated when they, when they see Jesus and they, and they think, hey, this is, this is, this is, the, this is what, what I'm, I'm growing into. I've got so far to go. I'm falling so far short. It, it just seems too hard. It's too much. And, and, and it can either lead to just giving up entirely or it can lead to striving. It can lead to striving in, in, in your own strength. And I want to encourage you this morning that, that to follow our analogy, to follow our analogy that, that essentially we're plants, we're Jesus plants, right? And we're meant to be growing up into the fullness of Jesus and bearing Jesus-like fruit, the fruit of the Spirit. The reality is, is that plants were made to grow. Plants were made to grow. That's what plants do. And I want to encourage you that if, if you've come to Jesus this morning, if, if Jesus is your Savior, if the Holy Spirit is dwelling within you, you have the, the very seed of the Word dwelling in your heart, you've got to understand you were made to grow into the fullness and the likeness of Jesus Christ. You were made to grow up and to bear that spiritual fruit, that fruit of the Spirit, all those things that we talked about, that, that, that were listed there before. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, goodness, faithfulness, self-control. All these things are fruits of your life and you were made to grow. But your rate of growth, your rate of growth will be directly determined by the conditions of the soil. It will be directly determined by the conditions of the soil. 
Plants grow all the time. They grow in the most inhospitable places. You go out to the desert, not much grows, but some stuff still makes a way. Some stuff is able to grow and, and to live long periods of time without, without fresh running water. Some things are able to grow and to live in the most inhospitable environments. And yet we know instinctually and we understand that if we want things to grow well, we want to place them in an environment where those things, where those plants can grow and they can thrive, where they're watered well, where they're fertilized, where, where they're given all the nutrients that they need in order to grow. You might, you might build a greenhouse in order to control the temperature and the climate so that, so that uh, the plants can grow quicker or more fruitfully. You were made to grow, but the rate at which you grow will be directly determined by the condition of the soil, by, by the conditions that are surrounding the plant. I believe Jesus, I believe Jesus picks this up when he, when he um, gives the parable of the sower. In the parable of the sower, I'll give you a brief recap if you're not familiar with it. In the parable of the sower, Jesus tells this, this story. He says, you know, a man goes out to sow seed in his field, and he's scattering it. He's scattering seed. And he says, some, some of the seed falls on the path where it's hard. And the birds of the air come and eat the seed before it can even take root. He says, some of, the, some of the seed that gets scattered gets scattered under shallow soil. And, and the seed quickly springs up but because it has no root. As soon as the sun comes out, it scorches it, and it withers away and dies. There's a, a third type of soil where, where um, there's rocks and weeds and all these sorts of things in it. And so the, the plants spring up, and they're growing well. But because of the weeds that grow up around it, it actually chokes out the life of the plant, and it fails to bear fruit, or it fails to actually grow into any kind of maturity. And he says, finally, there is this fourth soil, which is good soil. And seed that's planted in this soil, seed that's scattered in this soil, bears fruit 30, 60, 100 fold. It's, just, it's, it's, it's overly abundant. It's very fruitful. It's, it's, it, it grows um, and bears abundant fruit. And what's interesting is in the Gospels, every time this parable is told, the Gospel authors o always uh, put this addendum to it as well. What Jesus will say, and so... The measure you use will be measured to you. And the measure you use, that will be measured to you, and more will be given. But to the one who doesn't have, even what he has will be taken from him. What does this have to do with us in our growth? What does this have to do with us in our growth? Well, I believe in the parable, the soil is us. The soil is us. The state of our hearts. Are our hearts hard? Are our hearts untended? Do we have weeds growing up in our heart that's choking out the life of the Word in us? And what's interesting about the state of the soil is it's dependent upon us, is what Jesus is saying, I believe, when he says, the measure with which you use, that will be measured to you and more will be given. How open are, is your heart to growth? How open in your life are you to actually Growing and changing and being transformed. How attached are you to sin? What do I mean by that? Maybe you've got an annoying person in your, in your, in your workplace, right? And you just really get a lot of satisfaction. Really just get a lot of satisfaction about gossiping about that person behind their back. It just is the comfort of your day. That, that person's just so annoying. It just feels so good to just go into the, into the, into the tea room or whatever and just gossip about that person right? That's a weed. That's a weed that's sprung up in your heart. How attached are you? It, it will very much depend on your willingness to yield, yield to the Holy Spirit and what He's doing. So I want to give you some, I want to give you some, some parameters. Parameters are probably not the, the right. I want to give you some analogies to, to help to help you sort of shape your life so that it is ideal for growth in the Christian life. All right. And I'm gonna I'm gonna keep I'm gonna keep with the agricultural theme. Um, and so in order to grow and, and and remember remember you're made to grow. Plants grow. In the Christian faith you will grow. 
you will grow. But the rate of your growth will depend on the conditions that you give that seed of the word that's actually placed in you. All right? So in order to grow well, in order to grow well, grow well firstly, you need to be planted. You need to be planted somewhere. Now, you need to be planted in the church. Now, when I say the church, I don't mean this church. I like it when people are planted here. Not going to lie. I like having people here. I love all your faces, though they're covered up. All right? But you need to be planted in the church, wherever that is that God has planted you. Whether it's here, whether it's a church down the road, up the street, in another state, wherever it is, you need to be planted somewhere in the Lord's vineyard. Somewhere amongst the body of Christ, you need to be planted. And I want to just say as a word of wisdom, as a word of wisdom, just like plants that are constantly moved from one place to another fail to bear fruit, if you are constantly uprooting yourself from Christian community and moving around from place to place to place, you are going to struggle, you are going to struggle to develop the good community that you need to help you grow. You're going to struggle to develop that community well if you're constantly being uprooted and placed in different places all the time. Now, sometimes there's circumstances that cannot be helped. Sometimes people have jobs that take them all around the world and it's not possible. But <clears throat> even in that, you can still maintain that community relationship. You can still maintain those relationships with brothers and sisters in Christ. You need to be planted somewhere. It doesn't mean that it's a particular local congregation. I, I, I've known people who have had seasons where they, where they just like, you know, they're not part of a local church, but they've just had seasons where they've been either floating around to different churches and they've just been genuinely meeting up with other brothers and sisters in Christ, praying and worshiping together. And they have grown and they've thrived through that season. All right, but that's probably not going to look normative for most people. All right, but you need to be planted somewhere in order to grow. Secondly, in your planting, you need to give space for growth. You need to give space for growth. <clears throat> quite often in, in our quite often in our, our 21st century highly efficient economy, our goal with our lives is to squeeze as much economic production out of our lives as possible. And our lives are so full. And by full, I mean busy. Our lives are so busy that quite often we don't give space to almost anything else. Yes, we'll come to church on a Sunday morning. We can allocate that hour and a half, two hours of time to the Lord. And maybe we'll pray, you know, 10 minutes, 15 minutes, you know, you know sometime during the week. But in order for you to grow, you have to give space to the Lord. You have to give space in your life for him to move, space in your life for him to work, space for him to, to begin to transform your thinking. If you're so preoccupied with every little thing, your mind is so busy and your heart is so busy all the time, you're not giving yourself enough space to grow. That's why when, when, when farmers, they plant plants, they give an adequate spacing between the plants so there's adequate space for the roots to go down. There's adequate light for each plant to receive and not blocked out by the... You need adequate space. So you need to be planted and you need to have space in your life for God to move. Second point is you need to be fed and fertilized. You need to be fed and fertilized. Which means you not only need to be planted, but you need to be getting fed. You need nutrients. You need to be feeding on the Word of God. You need to be feeding and, and meditating upon this thing, this book. You know, we, we, we talked about, you know, what the Bible is and, and how to read it. And, and, and really, we need to be feeding off His Word. We need to be learning from Him. Because remember, remember, if our goal, if our goal is to be like Jesus, where are we going to learn what that looks like? Where are we going to learn where that looks like? The, the Spirit, no doubt, is going to prompt you and is going to show you how to love in various situations. The Holy Spirit does that. And he's very good at that. But one of the ways in which he's going to teach that to you, one of the ways in which he's going to give that knowledge to you is through the Word, is through the Scriptures. You need to be feeding upon the Word, whether that's listening to sermons. I, I would recommend listening to sermons. I would recommend you get very familiar with this book. 
Get very familiar with this book. Learn to love it. Learn to meditate upon it. Learn to chew it over and let it take effect in your heart. So you need to be fed and fertilized. Third point is you need to be breathing because plants breathe. And, and I'm trying to shoehorn into an analogy some very important points I think that are very important to Christian growth. They're trying to wedge it into a plant analogy. So forgive me. But you need to be breathing. Plants, they breathe in CO2 and they breathe out oxygen. Right? Likewise, we need to be breathing in the Spirit through prayer and breathing out worship. See how I did that? Seamless. Seamless. Very green thumb right here. Prayer and worship are incredibly important. Incredibly important to the Christian life. Because you're developing that intimacy with Him. Learning to be familiar with His presence. Creating that space in your life where there's not just space, but you're open and you're pursuing Him. Where you're not just bringing your cares and your concerns, and you're not just bringing your burden and, and putting it at His feet. Though please, continue to do that. Always bring all your burdens and give them to the Lord. But also having that space where you just talk to Him. Where you develop that relationship, where you develop that friendship. Where you develop that place where you, you learn to worship Him and enjoy His presence. You will be amazed. You will be amazed at what will begin to happen in your heart and your life if you dedicate regular time to prayer and to worship as a part of your week. You, again, as a plant, you're made to grow, right? And you can't just force fruit out. Sometimes as plants, we want to just force the fruit out. But that's not how it works. But given the right conditions, given the right conditions, fruit will grow. And God's presence, God's presence is the incredible atmosphere with which fruit actually grows in our lives. And so I want to encourage you to be dedicated to creating space in your life, in your schedule for prayer and for worship. Because that will create an environment that allows fruit to grow in your life. <clears throat> and lastly, you need to be open to being pruned. You need to be open to being pruned. This is what Jesus says, you know, that he's the branch and his father is the vine dresser. He is the gardener. You see, quite often as, as Christians, well, just as people, we want the fruit, but we never want the pruning. You know, we, we want abundance, but we never want, we never want necessarily the pain associated with getting to that place. And God's desire for you is to bear more fruit. God's desire for you is to be abundantly fruitful in your life. But in order for that to happen, in order for that to happen, it's not simply a matter of creating an environment where, where the plant can grow. There are times when there's dead branches that need to be cut off. There's, there are times when there are parts of your life that are not bearing fruit and are never going to bear fruit. Whether they're gross, obvious sins that need to just be cut out. Whether they're patterns of living that you, it's just become so normal to you, you can't even recognize you can't even recognize that that's not bearing fruit. And it's actually inhibiting you from bearing fruit in other areas of your life. You need to be open to the leading of the Holy Spirit for Him to actually cut things off in your life. I remember, I remember this happened to me one time um, early on in my Christian walk. Um, you know, I, I, just, I just started, you know, really began sort of committing myself to prayer and, and things were, you know, things were, I, I, fe I felt like I was growing by leaps and bounds. Like God, just like every day, every week, God was just doing like a massive overhaul of something in my life or something in my heart. And, and I got to this point where it was just like, I was praying and then all of a sudden this friend came to mind. This friend came to mind. And, um, and I knew that every time I hung out with this friend, you know, we had a great time. We, we, could always, we could just talk for hours and really just a great friendship. But every time I would hang out with this person, I would just feel like a longing to kind of go back to the world. 
this is a weird thing. I would just feel this longing to kind of go back to the world. But, but he was such a good friend, right? You know, and you don't cut off friends. And yet I felt in that moment, like the Lord said, you need to cut off that relationship. You need to cut off that relationship. And I was like, you know, God, I can't do it. <laughs> you know, you know, I can't do it. I, th I, th I think, you know, I think, I you know, <laughs> it's like, you know, I think I tried like initially, like just be like, you know, I'm just not going to talk to him anymore. You know, and, and then it was just like, and then God actually did it for me. God actually, it was, it was the weirdest thing. It wasn't harsh. It wasn't like, you're not my friend. It was none of that. It was just this weird thing. It was just like, it was just like, Lord, I, I don't know if I can do that. And it was like, he was like, okay. And then it was like, all of a sudden, we just didn't talk or hang out anymore. Just out of nowhere. It's just like life shifted. And his life shifted. And I remember we caught up like six months later and the relationship just, just wasn't quite the same. And yet, without this person in my life, I wasn't constantly having that influence that was just like, that was, you know, leading me to want, you know, worldly success and, and these sorts of things. And it allowed other areas of my heart and my life to actually grow and flourish and thrive. And I don't know what that is for you. It, it, it's going to be different stuff for different people, right? But you need to be open to being pruned. You need to be open to the idea that there's going to be parts of your life that just are not good. And it's not going to necessarily be obvious stuff to you. Sometimes it's stuff that's in your life and God's like, I really want to bear fruit in this area of your life. And you've got this thing that's happening over here that you are so conditioned to think this is normal and this is okay and this is, this is a good thing maybe even. But once you have it removed from your life, you're going to be able to see just how much that was actually holding you back. You're going to see just how much better the life I have for you is without that thing in your life. I want to encourage you, you need to be open to being pruned. And finally, and I'm just going to invite the, the music team back. And finally, <clears throat> I want to give you an encouragement. I want to give you an encouragement. To summarize, to summarize first, and then I'll encourage you. To summarize first, to grow as Christians, what we're aiming to do is to grow in our Jesusness. We're growing to be like Jesus. We are being transformed into the likeness of his character. That's what should be happening in our lives. And in order for that to happen, you can't just force it out. You can't just force out fruit. But if you carefully cultivate your life and, and create an environment for your life that's conducive for fruit to grow, you will bear fruit. You will grow. You will mature. You will change. You will bear fruit 30, 60, and 100 fold. And that really depends on how committed you are, how committed you are to actually creating that environment in your life for the Holy Spirit to actually work and to bear fruit in you. And lastly, I just want to leave you with an encouragement. As you pursue growing in Christ, as you pursue growing in your Jesusness, fruit often takes time. Fruit often takes time, and that's okay. You know, when from the time you plant, from the time you plant a fruit tree, right, from a seed. I'm not talking about those grafted fruit trees you can get, you know, that are, that are already three or four years old and they've, you know, <laughs> they've, they've got a, a, a grafting from a plant and, and they grow it from that. I'm talking about from a seed. You're probably looking at about five to seven years before you see any fruit from that tree. And yet, that's the way a fruit tree is supposed to work. And so I want to encourage you in your walk with the Lord that if you are not going at leaps and bounds, if you're not growing at the rate at which you think you should grow, I want to encourage you that sometimes fruit just takes time. Fruit just takes time. Don't get discouraged. Keep going. Keep pursuing the Lord. Keep pursuing His presence. Keep growing in your knowledge and understanding of His Word. Keep being open to the leading of the Holy Spirit. Keep allowing your life to be pruned. Keep at it, keep at it, keep at it. Because He will produce fruit in your life.
That's what plants do. It's what they do. It's just by their nature. It's what they do. And I want to encourage you. Sometimes fruit takes time. And if you have yet to see the fruit that you want to see in your life, I want to urge you, do those things. Do those things that I mentioned. Create that space. Create that environment. Prayer, worship, feeding upon the Word, being open to being pruned. And I, I, I'm certain, because I've experienced it time and time again, the Lord will begin to bear fruit in your life, uh, 30, 60, and hopefully 100-fold. And so I'm going to pray, and actually I'll get you to stand. I'm just going to enter into a, a time of worship here at the end. So Jesus, I just pray that you would help us to be like you. That as we leave the ways of this world and we follow after you, that Jesus, you would disciple us. That you would disciple us in your ways. That Holy Spirit, you would disciple us in how to love. You would disciple us in how to live like Jesus. I pray that, that for each and every single person here, you would help us to bear fruit. You would help us to bear fruit, Lord. So Holy Spirit, we thank you that you're at work in this place. Lord, I thank you that where maybe my words have fallen short. that, Lord, you're more than able, more than capable of making things clear. I pray, Holy Spirit, that you be encouraging people's hearts, that bearing fruit is not an onerous task, but it's a beautiful and glorious thing. And we thank you, Lord, for how you're working in us individually and how you're working in this church.
for anything, uh, if there's brokenness or sickness in your body, um, if there's family situations or life situations that are going on and, and you would like somebody to pray with you, um, I want to encourage you, there's going to be people here just at the front who are ready and willing to pray with you. I want to encourage you to, to avail yourselves of that if you need prayer. Um, and secondly, uh, we're, we're, what we want to do is we want to leave this space here. It's just a, a space for people to just to continue to stay in, in, in that place of worship and engaging with the Lord. And so um, there's no obligation for you to stay, obviously. But, um, yeah, we would just ask that that, um, that if, you, if you're going to move over into a time of fellowship, we just ask that you would just go out and around into the cafe area um, just so that we can kind of reserve this space for people who, who are spending time with the Lord. We just want to leave that space for people. And then um, thirdly, Thirdly, um, if this is your church, this is your church that you call home, um, and you see somebody who is new or you don't recognize, even if even maybe they've been here for a few weeks, like, I don't know, I want, I want you to make the effort to make them feel welcomed, make them feel loved. Um, and I'll say it again, it, the point is not to try and get them to come back. The point is that we as God's people are known by our love. We want to make sure that everyone who comes through our doors receives that same hospitality and that same love that Jesus offers to us. And so I, want to, I just want to encourage you um, that if this is your church, I want to kind of put that on you to make people feel welcome, to make them feel loved when they come here. Um, but I'm going to pray, and then um, and the team is going to keep worshiping, and you can either go to a time of fellowship in the cafe area, um, or if you do really have to go, um, that, that's also all right. So I'm going to pray. Lord, Lord, we just thank you. Lord, we just thank you for your presence. We thank you for how you, you love us and how you're patient with us and how you're kind and gentle to us. We thank you how you, you feed us and you nurture us and encourage us to grow. So Jesus, we thank you for your spirit. Father, we thank you for your salvation. We thank you for your love. I pray, Lord, you would bless us now as we...